the university is also quite clear that that we we don't think that 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 kind of questions of climate change can be uh, uh, thought about without thinking about some of the key uh, kind of questions of inequality that are that are linked to the social and the economic aspects of the transition. Um, so, with with that in mind, we've we've come had a, we've come had a series of uh, uh, lectures from really prominent speakers uh, 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 kind of on questions of on uh, kind of questions of climate change. Uh, for our first such uh, uh, seminar for this year, um, I'm really thrilled. Uh, 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 that uh, that we can have someone of the prom uh, kind of of the prominence uh, and 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 of the intellectual capacity of Adam Tooze. Uh, so, to kind of Adam, we're really really pleased to have you here. Uh, 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 thank you for for um, 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 making the trip to South Africa, um, and we're really looking forward to your talk. Uh, kind of to your talk today. So I'm going to shortly pass on to our DVC research, who's going to officially uh, kind of introduce uh, kind, of, uh, 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 kind of Adam Tooze. We'll then have a talk of about 14 um, um, <laughs> minutes that Adam will do. And then we want to open it up for any questions that, um, that uh, 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 that you have both for those of you who are kind of who are here in uh, kind of in um, in the room, and also for those of you who are here online with us. So with that, let me pass it on to our D um, to our DVC for research. Lynn, over to you. We're just going to change the mic quickly or the mic stand. Right, thank you very much. Whoops, maybe I'll just hold it. How about that? <laughs> thanks, thanks, Imran. And um, thanks, Imran and Keith, for inviting Adam. And uh, it's really my great honor to, uh, to tell you a little bit more about him. Um, so Adam was born in London, and he grew up between England and Germany. He did a BA in economics at uh, King's College in Cambridge, and then he did his PhD at the London School of Economics. From 1996 to 2009, um, Adam taught at the University of Cambridge, where he was a reader in modern history and a fellow in history at Jesus College. After Cambridge, Adam moved to Yale University, and thereafter he joined the Col Columbia's History Department in the summer of 2015, where he currently is, and he's the Catherine and Selby Cullum Davis Professor of History and the Director of the European Institute. But Adam is known for his scholarship on the economic and political history of Europe and the world. He's been described as a historian of economic disasters. Um, and he popularized the term polycrisis, which describes the impact of multiple and simultaneous crises. And he's written extensively on the history of the German economy, including his book, The Wages of Destruction, The Making and Breaking of the Nazi Economy, which won numerous awards, including the Wilson History Prize. He has also written about the global financial crisis of 2008 and its aftermath in his book, Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. His latest book is called Shutdown, How COVID Shook the World's Economy. In it, he describes how COVID-19 is the result of humans getting too close to viruses, previously safely contained in wild animals. And he quotes, for the last century, we've been riding our luck but finally, nature has bitten back. And Adam's books have been translated into 11 languages. But his work has been widely recognized and awarded, and he's been elected as a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and the British Academy. In 2019, Foreign Policy Magazine named him as one of the top global thinkers of the decade. He's also a regular contributor to various publications, including The Guardian, New York Times, Financial Times, New Left Review, just to name a few. He's appeared on PBS television, BBC Radio, History Channel, Swiss and French television. 
He also runs a very active Substack newsletter called Chartbook with over 80,000 subscribers. And he even posted one earlier today on the Silicon Valley bank crisis. So he's really unbelievably pro prolific. And uh, I, I believe at lunchtime today, he was talking up to, to the students to uh, pick up some tips about how we can adopt some of these uh, techniques to um, uh, increase our outputs. But, but Adam's great intellectual power is his gift for synthesis. One of his former PhD students, Ted Furtick, who is now a policy strategist, says he just di digests staggering amounts of information. He roves across vast fields of data, historical data, technical data, data about Russian currency reserves, data about the Nazi steel tube industry, and returns with a reasonably accessible brief in hand. His omnivorous, omnivorous, omnivorous quantitative approach combines with his economic expertise to reveal familiar subjects in new ways. But I'd like to add that Adam is the original chat GPT long before chat GPT existed. But unlike chat GPT, what Adam says is reliable. So we look forward to your talk, Adam. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very so it's, a, it's an extraordinary pleasure to be here it's my first time in south africa and and i've just been soaking things up as quickly as i can i am a bit of a sponge i am omnivorous intellectually and uh there are a few places in the world which offer a richer feast than than south africa so i'm i'm glutted um uh, but very very excited about the time i've spent here if folks are interested in continuing the conversation with me very easily accessible just email me find me online and uh, it'd be a real polite real delight we have lots of time today i also have a i also have a kind of have a kind of straight ahead massive big question here facing the global climate crisis in a world of inequality who should pay and who will pay um and, it, and i've been struggling with it i have to say um ever since we agreed on the title uh, i've been struggling with it and the and the, the response i want to give you today is a little equivocal a little perplexing and i want to sort of speak about my perplexity in facing this this question because it haunts all of us we can't really escape it and yet we were talking earlier on it's, it's kind of difficult to formulate a clear angle on it and i want to share in a sense that sense of perplexity with you I mean, on the one hand, we're just facing an outright disaster. This is the news of the last week, um, ladies and gents. If you were paying attention to something else you thought was more important, we were probably all wrong. Uh, Beijing's rec hit a record temperature this spring. Beijing is a cold northeast Asian city. It hit a record temperature of almost 28 degrees centigrade this week. And Latin America, um, uh, Argentina in particular, is literally burning up. And all the while, as if to answer the question with a kind of two-fingered salute, um, we are pumping more and more CO2 into the atmosphere. And the period of climate diplomacy, which was opened bravely in 1989 or 1990, depending on how you date it, the science goes back another decade, if you like, in Europe and the United States, has seen a progressive increase, not quite a doubling, but nevertheless a catastrophic increase in CO2 emissions. And are we halting this train? Are we heeding the advice from agencies like the IEA, which say no more fossil fuel investment? No, we are not. These are the data from the IEA for 2022 on investment in fossil fuels broken down by the major areas last year. So it was 676 billion. This is somewhat down on the pre-crisis level, but it nevertheless way ahead of where we need to be for stabilization. And I think this reality sits with us and haunts us and we know it and we know it follows us in our dreams and it makes us anxious about our future and our children's future and our grandchildren's future. On the other hand, realism dictates that we also recognize the fact that we live in a world in which in 2019, zero, net zero pledges covered 16% of the global economy by GDP. And in March, as of March 2023, because there are eager people who track this kind of thing, 92% of the world's economy is covered by nation state, national contribution, net zero commitments, which range in the case of India and China out beyond 2050. But nevertheless, uh, this is a huge sea change. So the question I really want to confront us with this afternoon is, is this for real? What does this mean that we live in a world in which on the material side, the crisis builds ever more. We continue to contribute to it. And yet, politically speaking, we cannot any longer deny that there is massive momentum, and not just from the political side, but from business as well, from investors as well, to a scenario like this. This is now the baked in 
programmatic development trajectory of the world economy, give or take. You can stretch that line a little bit by a decade or so at the bottom end, but everyone needs to, uh, the, the commitment of 93% of the world's GDP by national governments, 133 plus governments, is we have to overcome our skepticism to this trajectory. And I kind of want to struggle with you to get to grips with and make sense of this sort of almost schizophrenic world that we inhabit. And it isn't, as I was saying, just politicians, serious people, non-serious, non, -serious, non, -serious, non politicians. This is Mark Carney, the former, you know, the boss formerly of the of the Canadian Central Bank and then the Bank of England, now back in private finance. And I excite him because the one thing you can be clear about about Mark Carney is he has serious as a heart attack and the most careerist person you'll ever meet in your entire life. This man knows where the music plays, where the weather's blowing, and he is on board with this. This is his career track. If you are a man of global brilliance and you're Canadian, you have a problem. What story is it that you ride? You ride the climate train. That is the Carney shtick. That's highly significant in terms of elite selection. Where are people like him gravitating towards? They're gravitating towards this. And they're gravitating towards this narrative, which is a technological narrative and an investment-driven narrative. This is not do-gooding politics. This is not the old heard the stories about, about the European situation. And there is a period, as you can see here, uh, from the summer of 2022 through to September 2022, in which the Europeans did backslide. They had to backslide. There were serious issues about the reliability of their gas situation. The Europeans are not heading towards an ESCOM scenario. They double down on coal. But as you can see here, the trajectory, which is the trend line, as the yellow line is firmly down. And if you look outside the fossil fuel sector, 2022 was an absolute record year for European renewable investment. The point, the crucial point to make here is we need to check against our, as it were, backsliding prejudice. There's a kind of cynicism in the commentary that will seize on any news to destabilize, if you like, the, 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 the idea of an energy transition as a fairly powerful technological process. It's just not true. The argument now in favor of renewable energy across most of the world is really quite one simple. It's kind of one way. And uh, it's driving even in societies under massive stress by advanced economy standards. So these are societies which saw a six-fold increase in the price of utility bills. They didn't break. The momentum is still there. And around the world, what we're seeing is also the taking up of the green agenda and the renewable energy agenda by new constituencies, notably the national security establishment, which is now driving the issue, even of things as harmless as electric vehicles. You wouldn't think this was the cutting edge of the tech arms race. It isn't like silicon chips and artificial intelligence. And yet, nevertheless, it has become the arena for a strategic battle between the United States and China. I'll say a little bit more about this later on. So we see you know, as hard boiled as you could possibly imagine, approach converging on the idea that the, the energy transition is a reality that has to be confronted and is going to shape and define our future. So as soon as I started thinking about this question, which starts with the, from this question of inner world of inequality, who should pay and who will pay, and you contrast that with a kind of discussion that's going on in Brussels, that's going on in, in Washington, and going next week to a meeting of the French and German government, which are trying to concert their position on this. This is no longer the way in which they frame the question. The way in which they frame it is this, this way. Who will take charge of the energy transition and who will profit from the energy transition? We've moved from a world, if you like, in which the energy transition is a political objective foisted on the economic and geopolitical system from the outside to one in which it has been absorbed into the decision-making systems, both of the national security state and capitalism, to put, no, you know, to put it bluntly, as a scenario for the future. And the question that I want to sort of set alongside that and have hovering over the rest of this talk is, as it were, the meta question of what kind of world are we in that makes it seem as though those are the right questions rather than perhaps the place I started with. Or to put it another way, in a more open way, how is it, what does this in the shift indicate about the way the world is moving? Because the question of justice that is posed at the beginning hasn't gone away, but it is now in dialogue with these other two questions, which are questions of power and questions of profit. One thing that's, for instance, happened is that our vision of the business as usual scenario, which organizes climate politics in a very powerful way, your baseline assumption of where we're headed unless we do something has shifted incredibly dramatically. So this is the old baseline scenario, the so-called 8.5 scenario, which as you can see is catastrophic. This is a four to five degree warming scenario over the next 50 to 100 years. And you can see in the middle, it's dominated by the extrapolation of China's coal-driven growth from the 90s and 2000s into the future. 
That is now an incredibly unlikely scenario, even though for more than a decade, it anchored climate policy as the, as it were, scare scenario of where we're headed. The sort of scenarios that we are now, broadly speaking, I think, having to assume as, you know, this is this question of if you're realistic, what do you assume will happen unless you do something dramatic? If we carry on along the kind of trajectory that we're currently on, the, I think the modal assumption, the place where we think most of the balance of probability is, is somewhere in the in the, the scenarios which head down. So we, we think maybe we'll get to net zero much later than 2050, push it out to 2060, 2070. That leaves you with global warming in the two to three degree band. This, I think, has moved to the center of our attention as the world that we're headed towards. Places like in the New York Times, the central organ of American liberalism, the newspaper that if we were in the United States, literally 99% of the people in this room would read over breakfast every morning. Their key thinker on the environmental questions, David Wallace Wells, published an important essay, I think, back in October 2022 on this adjustment, and it's called Beyond Catastrophe. And the thesis of the the thesis of the paper is that we need to this article is that we need to adjust from a world in which we anticipate four to five degree warming as our central tendency to one in which we assume two to three is the norm. And David drew out of that really almost philosophical implications, right? Acknowledging that truly apocalyptic warming now looks considerably less likely than it did just a few years ago, pulls the future out of the realm of myth and returns it to the plane of history. Contested, combative, combining suffering and flushing, combining suffering and flourishing, though not in equal measure for every group. What he's trying to say, and as a historian, I like this move, is we move from a world in which we essentially paralyze ourselves with almost inevitable trajectories of disaster into a realm, into a world in which everything is to play for. Well, not everything, some important things are to play for. I think it's a powerful move that organizes quite a lot of thinking right now that we've moved from, as it were, anticipating total uh, collapse to navigating the world in between. If one reads David's piece, you can also see it as an absolutely quintessential example of American liberalism at a moment of relief. The pressure's off, they're feeling frisky again. And so one thing immediately goes out the window. I'm not sure whether you can see it. I can't see it terribly well from down here. But you know, history, in his case, becomes this open thing which you can fight over, immediately forgetting that the limits still remain. Right? The carbon budget is still there. This is still a finite struggle that we're having to deal with. And furthermore, of course, that kind of giveaway phrase at the end, though not in equal measure for every group, well, yes, inequality is there as a problem. No, what we're talking about is structurally unequal worlds, right? Worlds which are not sort of randomly distributed inequality, but structurally inherited and shaping every move that we make inequality. No need to repeat this point in South Africa, but hard also to imagine this kind of op-ed uh, dominating the news in a country like this, where legacies of inequality and oppression uh, uh, shape uh, absolutely every facet uh, of history and, and reality. But taking these you know, sort of criticisms apart, Aside, the, the Wallace Wells piece, I think, is indicative of, 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 of this move uh, in, in the world that we're in to uh, a world which is inherently more uncertain. Now, in a world of two to three degree world, in a world of two to three degree change, we know that disaster strikes and it is going to strike over and over again. And it is not going to strike haphazardly. And it is going to strike the continent of Africa more severely than practically anywhere else in the world. The only other part of the world in contention in a kind of competition of disaster will be South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. But those two continents are clearly most exposed. And it is not by accident, therefore, that we saw the emphasis shift in the recent climate conference in Egypt, COP27, compared to all previous meetings, with a focus both on loss and damage, which of course has been an insistent demand of the global south for decades, but also a demand for funding for adaptation. Because if we're in a two to three degree world, then adaptation will be key and the costs for the African continent are estimated. And these are nothing more than estimates. And I'm gonna to have to throw numbers around a lot today. And they're going to be back of the envelope exercises. But the significance of this is that 170 billion to $333 billion a year is serious money. Serious money up against Africa's combined GDP, serious money by anyone's standard. And what we saw in Egypt was the first, I think, really sustained retreat by the global north on these issues. Now, it's not very far, but it's conceptual and it opens a door that we've not seen open before, which is the agreement to establish a loss and damage fund. 
all of the technicalities, including all of the hard stuff, who pays for it and what it's used for, undecided, but the Americans actually signed on to the establish, um, establishment of the loss and damage fund. If you know anything about the history of climate politics at the COPs, you'll know this is a huge and bewildering concession from their part, because the Americans are lawyers, the American team is legalese, they know that this admits potentially a possibility of liability, and the Americans are very loath to admit that. So they haven't. What they designated the loss and damage for is clearly catastrophe relief. It's all about relief in the case of particular shocks. It isn't structural loss and damage that's on the table, but you can see the climate of the COP27 talks adjusting, that's my point, to this new world of a two to three norm as our reality. If you go to somewhere like Davos, the World Economic Forum, the way they talk about this future of two to three degrees is all excitement. It's all about the prospects of investment and growth. It's all about the question of who profits from this transition. And why are they so excited about it? Because they too are talking about really big money. They're talking about a technologically feasible thing, which is the transition as you see here, this is just one bit of the global puzzle. This is the electricity generating bit, the SCOM bit. This is not vehicles or houses or agriculture or industry. You think of the climate problem, it essentially has five components, power generation, transport, domestic, industrial, and agriculture. So this is the very one of those, and it's the easiest bit. I mean, transferring your electricity generation, we know how to do that. It's really just a matter of organizing the capital. And the WEF, the Davos people, the World Economic Forum, are salivating at the prospect of this. How could you possibly go wrong with this project? It's doable. It's a trillion dollars in extra investment a year. That is not money wasted. It doesn't go into the ground. This is a source of profit for a business that can, can take advantage of it. If you scale this up to the global level, if you scale this across all of the needs of the advanced economies and the emerging and low income countries, and I'm not expecting you to be able to closely read these, but I think they're worth putting up to show you that we cannot hide from the fact that we know how much the energy transition globally could cost. And it's in the order of $4 trillion for transport industry, uh, domestic uh, uh, housing, and uh, the electricity generating sector. That is the kind of bill. And again, from the point of view of global business, this is not money wasted. This is not an expenditure out the door. This is huge turnover possibility. Right? It's a vast business opportunity that's coming down the pike now. When they say who pays, they don't care. The real question here is who profits. As a share of global GDP, well, global GDP is 85 trillion in 2022. It's going to grow from there. It's going to keep on growing from there. How much is 4 trillion as a share of 85 trillion? Is it doable? It's about 4.7% of global GDP currently. Can we imagine doing that? Well, hell we can, yes. This is America's military spending as a share of GDP over the course of the Cold War. And you can see that right the way through to the end of the Cold War, American military spending was precisely in the kind of range that we're talking about. So don't take seriously these scare stories where people will tell you that the energy transition requires a world war effort, like World War I or World War II. It's nonsense. That's 40% of GDP. The energy transition requires a collective mobilization at the kind of level apartheid South Africa massively overshot this in its defense spending, for instance. Any self-respecting member of NATO in the 50s and 60s was easily doing this kind of number. And does it blow your economy up or condemn you to inflation or anything? No, it doesn't. It circulates within your economy. It's the source of what Eisenhower famously called the military industrial complex. What we need is a green industrial complex that will sit there at about 1 20th of GDP and drive economic growth into the future. This is the vision that's kind of opening up when you ask this question, who'll pay? People say, I don't care because this is going to be so good for economic growth. What could possibly go wrong? Now, you could ask, is all of this stuff going to pay for itself? It's all very well to come like a Keynesian and say, we're going to spend this money, it'll drive growth. From a business point of view, this investment will only happen sector by sector if it figure, if it calculates as profitable at each sectoral level. And the good people at McKinsey have done the math for us. In fact, they did the math for the European Union. The European Union being, as it were, the lead cow, the lead elephant in the global energy transition, along with China much more accessible than China, so McKinsey's people can really get in there. And their conclusions were, what at first is a relatively sobering thing, so the solid graph, by bit of the, of the graph here, is the bit, the share of each sector's transition that will pay for itself on profit grounds, making no further assumptions. So you could conclude, okay, twos, it's all very well to drive growth, 
but we're going to have to figure out some redistributive mechanism to ensure that this gets done because the profit is not there. I figure my, my, my screen is gone. Well, it's built suspense. It's built suspense. What am I going to show you next? There we go. It's back. It's back. Excellent. Now let's see whether the clicker works. So, but the beauty is, of course, the viability of a green energy investment depends on the circumstances that you're in, depends on the parameters that you're in. And the one thing that will make a green energy investment totally worthwhile is if fossil fuels are really expensive. And one way that you can influence that is put a tax on them. And guess what? The Europeans have got a tax on fossil fuels right now. And here's McKinsey's second chart. This is the share of energy investment that will pay for itself if you have fossil fuel prices at different levels. And the top bar, where it basically will fully pay for itself, is 100 euros per ton of carbon. And guess what? Right now, the price of a European trade, a European emission certificate in European of Europe's carbon trading system is 100 euros per ton. Right now, literally any investment in the green transition in Europe will pay for itself, according to McKinsey's estimates. That is this world that I'm trying to conjure up for you in which we're losing excuses not to do this. Right? It becomes sort of unreasonable to assume it's not going to happen, because at this level, even on these kind of calculations, you end up there. Now, could there be bumps along the road? Yeah, this is capitalism. What would you expect? Of course, there are going to be bumps along the road. Is this going to be even and smooth? No. Let's go to Comrade Trotsky and listen to his wise counsel on how capitalist development unfolds globally. And the key concept or the key double concept is that capitalism's development inherently, necessarily and almost transhistorically always unfolds in an uneven and combined way. It's combined because we are part of a global economic system and influence each other dramatically. It's uneven because we start from different places and those different places drive us along different paths. And we interact with each other in more or less aggressive or less aggressive ways. And South Africa is the living proof of the logic of uneven and combined development at its most naked, violent and, and dramatic. And the society you live in, indeed the city that you live in, is just wander around. It's like if you're, if you're in this kind of space, it's dizzyingly fascinating. Let me step back from that slightly voyeuristic take on Doberg and focus instead on global energy transition. If it's true that renewables are cheaper and on balance better for energy security, who would you expect to take up that message most? It's the global energy importers. So who are they? Europe and China. So there is really at this point, follow the McKinsey logic and everything else, no reason on earth why you would expect the Europeans and the Chinese to be anything other than totally serious about the energy transition. It's really hard for them to think of reasons not to. Now, if the two global energy importers stop energy imports because they're going to decarbonize over the next 10 to 20 years, that obviously has a major impact on the balance of demand and supply in the global fossil fuel market. What you will then see increasingly is fossil fuel producers fighting for the remaining demand. Now, that could easily unleash what is called um, uh, in uh, environmental economics, a rebound effect. As you stop consuming fossil fuels, they get cheaper, so you're lured into consuming them again. But if Europe and China both apply carbon taxes and carbon border adjustment, as they're both committed to doing, that effect won't operate. So the, car the fossil fuel producers sit in a, the fish, if you like, the sharks sit in a diminishing pool of global demand for their output. And in that pool, we already know who wins this competition. And it isn't America, and it's not Exxon, and it's not fracking, nor is it Angola or Nigeria. It is OPEC that dominates this. Hands down, literally, if you basically drill a hole in the ground and much of Saudi Arabia, the oil comes out. They have near zero production costs. And the same is true in Qatar for gas. No one is ever going to beat them. So as that market shrinks, OPEC increasingly dominates that section. And then what we're going to see is a protectionist struggle on the part of the fossil fuel producers around the world uh, uh, for the future. This is one scenario, but just envision this as the sort of thing that could unfold precisely when this logic of technologically driven energy transition almost automatically kicks in. And what does it remind us of? Well, if you're a historically minded political economist, it reminds you, well, this actually, before I go there, these are the data. So this is this paper in Nature by Merkur et al, which I strongly recommend to you. And this spells this out. So these are the GDP losses in trillions of dollars to different parts of the world from the unfolding of this scenario. So on the left-hand side, you have Europe, which is a major net winner because electric power is going to be cheaper than ever before in history on this scenario. 
right? And everything will be electrified. And next to them, you have the Americans who suffer a $5 trillion, $4 trillion loss. Now, don't panic. America's economy, this is over many years, and America's economy is huge. But there are going to be very, very important and influential red state Americans hurting in this scenario. It becomes an internal political economy problem within the United States. America's power system, electric supply, is already transitioning. So that source, the coal miners are not losing their jobs because of liberals, they're losing their jobs because gas is so much cheaper than renewables is. And this is where I, I got ahead of myself. This is where any politically, historically minded political economist thinks of one of the most formative contributions to our understanding of the 20th century, which is Karl Polanyi's great transformation. Now, most liberals read Karl Polanyi as an account of the heroic period of social democracy and the emerging out of globalizations and imperialism's triumphant march through the late 19th century to the 1940s, of the welfare state, the New Deal, the compact of the 1940s and 50s. But as somebody who grew up in West Germany in the age in which we rediscovered fascism and Hitler, who wrote his first books about Nazi Germany, I read Karl Polanyi as an analyst of fascism. And the sector out of which fascism emerges on this account is guess what? A large traditional producer of energy of a sort, food, farming, stopped by a massive global glut of incredibly cheap alternatives, which is the grain glut from the United States. And ladies and gentlemen, this is what the grain market in the world looks like even today. Globalization didn't happen in agriculture globally. It's still a, it's a rat's nest, a cat's cradle of nationalist, protectionist, exclusionary deals, and no continent has suffered worse from that than Africa, which has been largely excluded from the advantages of the division, global of division of labor that might have been available. That is a potential future for the global energy regime. This sort of balkanized, competitive, politically charged, because fascism mobilized around the peasantry who were the blood, who were you know, rooted in the soil, they were the salt of the earth. You know this only too well from Africana ideology and the way in which the Boers understood their role as, as settler colonialists. That image is what drove Nazi imperialism as well, and it's rooted in a dogfight over agricultural protectionism. That is one of the risks here. It's not for nothing that the far left in the climate movement talk about fossil, capital, fossil fascism. That is the sort of politics that we might see emerging. Now, but that takes us down the gloomy space, and that's not where I'm at. I'm in this sort of ambiguous hovering position because if we're smart enough to understand this in the last five minutes, so are the people in power in Brussels and the United States. And for the last two and a half years, the Biden administration and Brussels have been doing a dance around each other over the question of how they avoid the apparently inevitable clash over the green energy transition. That's how serious this has become, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a secondary issue for either Brussels or the United States. For Brussels, it's an identity issue. For Biden, it's a key part of his four or five point governmental plan. And inside the White House, people are working at this, and I'll illustrate this at the end of my talk in a rather dramatic way, literally day by day to defuse this. So we started with the carbon border adjustment, the, the European tax on imports, which kicked up a huge furore in the United States. Then they created a US Trade and Technology Council in June 2021, which was supposed to arbitrate these conflicts before they exploded. Then at COP26, they did the aluminium and steel deal, which was to defuse one of the areas where things were going to be most explosive. The idea is to build a giant green market for aluminium and steel targeted at, guess who? Russia and China, who are major exporters of aluminium and steel. Then, of course, they rolled out the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, which South Africa is the lead example of. You could think of that as an effort to manage the imperialist impulse on the part of the Europeans and the Americans. Let's do it together and focus on ESCOM as an obvious problem. Then in the spring of 2022, because the Americans are in the business of exporting their freedom molecules, in March 2022, we got the European-American LNG deal, which is the Americans systematically, very unapologetically, building a market for the export of a less polluting fuel than oil or coal. And then finally, the European proposal for Critical Raw Materials Club, which is a joint European-American effort to challenge China in the raw materials space. This is for real. This is actually happening. So this points to my thesis that our original kind of fatalistic pessimism that there's nothing going on does not capture the, the world of a global diplomacy at this point. The strategic materials case is of course on everyone's mind because we are, and this is one of the weird things that's going on, and it's quite hard for an economist to digest who grew up you know, in the good old days of 
the 1970s, 1980s, when we thought we understood the relationship between macro and micro and monetary policy and fiscal and the real and the monetary economy, we're all now all of a sudden worried about these things called supply chains. I mean, when having to know about a supply chain is an admission of failure on the part of an economist, right? Because the market pricing is supposed to take care of that. When you actually have to worry about how stuff gets made, something is broken down in the economic system. And have, when you have to start worrying about whether somebody else has got the critical things that you need to make your stuff, then we're in a really post-economic space. But that is where we're at. People are doing these kind of very serious exercises now. All of these numbers I'm just showing is illustrative of the kind of space in which governmental thinking is at this moment. There are very serious teams of both Chinese, Asian American, and European and American scholars trying to figure out how much copper we're going to need to do the electrification program. Literally count the beans, count the materials. Again, this is so far removed from the reality of 1980s or 1990s macroeconomic policy, it's pretty hard to convey. We could talk more about it. The conclusions of this particular exercise are actually fairly reassuring. And there is a whole discursive space that opens up here. And again, this is, goes to this question, the meta question of my talk this evening, what is realism? There is a sort of horrible way in which talking about raw materials makes you feel kind of more real, more grounded, more on the ground, about stuff. Right? There's a kind of nacho move to the hard power, zero sum balancing of who gets the copper and who doesn't. Right? You know what I'm the, the, the sort of mindset, I'm sure you've encountered it. Um, and the function, and I think the virtue of exercises like this one, which is to say that I think I can just about read it, that we need about 14% of the current supply of copper to get us there. Now that's to my mind, relatively reassuring. Of course, we need to expand copper mining worldwide, and that's a huge, diff hugely difficult problem with long lead times. But we're not in the world in which, you know, you immediately deduce the necessity of war between China and the West over this issue of whether or not we can somehow find 15% more copper in the global system. These data, as artificial as they are, have a hugely political role right now, and we need to be very sensitive and develop a kind of critical intelligence for reading them. But they're everywhere. And one of the effects, of course, is that they produce a kind of historic reversal. And Keith and I were talking about this, because one of the effects of this new preoccupation on the, both the Chinese, the European, and the American parts with materials is it recenters Africa. All of a sudden, Africa roars back as a central arena for global political economy. 10 years ago in the think tank world, outside the development economics world, you would have found it very hard to find Africa expertise in Washington, for instance. And still to this day, America's view of Africa is absolutely channeled by competition with China over raw materials. But the leap is there, the shift has happened. The transition is absolutely real. This continent has become and South Africa is an absolutely strategic node, has become an epicenter. I mean, centers are springing up around the universities that I've had the pleasure of interacting with in the last 48 hours for Asian African, Chinese African relations, and that scares the Americans witless. Right? The last thing in the world they want to see is major universities in South Africa developing closer contacts and more expertise about China. That is not in Washington's best interest. It is clear, however, that Africa has to be at the heart of this entire question uh, going forward. Permit me this sort of generalization of talking this way about this giant and diverse continent, because it is an effect of the kind of discourse I'm describing. Africa is seen as a single entity which then has to be mapped in various ways. It is quite clear to go back to the original impetus of the question this evening, the question of justice and harm and who pays that Africa doesn't allow you to evade that question. Right? It's all very well for the folks in Europe and the United States to bunker themselves into the view that what we're really talking about here is power and money. From the point of view of Africa, the red dots on this graph, which displays on the right-hand side on the, on the, along the x-axis the rate of population growth, and on the left-hand side an index of climate vulnerability. And pick your index. This is a complex one with about six components. Pick your index. They always say the same that the African countries are simultaneously amongst the most exposed and the least well-equipped to deal with the uh, pressures that are coming uh, uh, our way over the next 20 to 30 years in this best case scenario, or rather in our business as usual scenario, the one which David well, uh, 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 Wallace Wells describes as not catastrophic. In that world, Africa is in the crosshairs in this two to three world, two to three degree world. And we can be more specific about that. It is this cohort of African young people and their children who are in the crosshairs. If you ask the question of who will pay, 
for the climate crisis, we can be much more sociologically specific. It is that giant cohort of young Africans and their immediate descendants who are going to transform the demographic picture of the world in a way we've never seen before, who are in the crosshairs of this question and for whom this question of justice has to be central. It's important to emphasize this because India, for instance, which was once upon a time the driver of the climate justice question is about to defect on you because India is moving into the other camp. India's total emissions are now larger than those of Europe, larger than those of Europe. So it has overtaken the old hub of the industrial revolution. India is going to position it quintess itself quintessentially as a renewable energy power. They're playing this for power and for money. Adani, the Indian businessman who's in such trouble, was going to be the profit-driven lead elephant of their, of their green energy policy. Africa's position in this sort of scenario, unless things dramatically change, and that's what I want to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes talking about, is in a very different position from that of all of the other most vulnerable, uh, vulnerable um, uh, 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 players in the system. When you start talking about demography, one important, um, one important point to make, especially in discussions with Western climate observers, is a sort of, um, is a sort of killing of a red, of a, removing of a red helling, the killing of a canal, the removal of an irrelevant idea. Because one of the ideas that haunts people when they see these awesome numbers for Africa's demographic development over the next 20 to 30 years is that Africa's population growth is going to become a driver of the climate crisis. And this is obscene nonsense. It's not true because Africa's per capita consumption of energy in large part, and particularly in the countries with the most rapid demographic development is negligible by comparison with that of the West. The average Malian uses as much electricity every year as it takes a Brit to boil a kettle, a single kettle, right? So under those circumstances, Mali's historically high population growth rate makes not a damn bit of difference to the climate equation one way or another. It jeopardizes Mali's economic development prospects perhaps, but it does not make a difference to the global climate equation. Another way of looking at this is this. So at South Africa, of course, is a very different kettle of fish, fits in a very different bracket. But when we're looking at the truly low-income countries of Africa, they are in that top bar. Now, if they achieve, were they, for instance, over the next 20 to 30 years to achieve a miracle, which is to raise their GDP and energy consumption to the level of a lower middle income country, which would imply a six-fold increase in their energy consumption per capita and therefore emissions, they would still only be contributing three to 4% of the global energy budget. And that is a trade-off any person in their right mind should take, should bite your hand off for that deal, because you're raising half a billion people out of, uh, out of material poverty, massive child uh, mortality, uh, and very diminished life expectancy. Now, it is clearly the case that for Africa, the renewable energy revolution should be a giant gift because there are very few other places in the world with the potential. The only other place with similar kind of numbers for sun and wind is India. But those two together make out by far and away the most promising zone for renewable energy transition. But just as a sort of corrective, and I'm going to concede this point as somebody who speaks with a European accent, anyone Anyone who's in the development business who makes a fetish out of preventing funding for gas-fired power stations as backup reserve capacity in African countries really needs to have their head examined. It's an outrage. It's an absolute outrage in light of the way in which Europe has monopolized the gas market this year. Even with renewables, you need cheap backup reserve capacity. Africa needs, obviously, to emphasize renewable development for all of the obvious reasons. It should amount to 80 to 85 percent of Africa's energy consumption by 2030. But above all, the continent needs to multiply its per capita energy consumption by any amount that we can get to as quickly as possible. It's as simple as that. It should be a test of good faith. It is, to my mind, truly inexcusable the position the European Investment Bank has taken. But it is a sign of not being able to add up. It's a sign of not being able to think the sustainable development revolution as something that actually has an arithmetic logic. And those glass, I think, are absolutely clear cut on this. The question needs to be not how we keep Africa's development squeaky clean and devoid of every conceivable contamination with lock-in on any single front. The question has got to be how does this continent and how do its nation states position themselves so as to take advantage of what everyone else is taking advantage of, namely the profit and power boom of the next 20 to 30 years in this space. One route, which a lot of people are going down, seems to me the most negative. And this is the carbon credits idea, which was the toast of the COP27. This is literally an idea where Africa sells its reductions in emissions 
<laughs> a continent where Mali consumes as much power as a Brit consumes the boiler kettle is going to sell further emissions rights by reducing its emissions in exchange for money from the West. Now, and the sort of money is coming from the players you see on the right hand side here. We're talking very big brand name Western companies, Delta, VW, Netflix, for crying out loud, buy African carbon certificates. And when I say it was the toast of COP27, I mean it. This is a junket. There is a huge mobilization of the global elite around this idea because it's a beautiful idea. If you're a high emitting Westerner like me, and I need to offset 20 to 30 to maybe even 40 tons of carbon a year because of my crazy flying, I need to buy it from somewhere. And of course, it will be cheaper if I buy it from an African country than if I have to reward a European or an American for giving me that trade off. Right. And look at the coalition of people that are involved with this deal. It tells you two things. A lot of big money, a lot of powerhouses. Gates Foundation are in there. Um, um, it's, it's a thing that's going to roll and it's going to roll because it promises big bucks. If you do the math on this, you could sequestrate 2 billion tons per annum. That would generate tens of billions of dollars for African development. That's the lure, the bait and switch, right? The far more, I think, promising route to go down is not so much carbon sinks and carbon credits, uh, but hydrogen. Hydrogen, not because it's unproblematic. We're not in a zone of unproblematic here. We don't have any unproblematic choices. We don't know whether hydrogen really is going to be the future. But hell, it's a pretty good bet because it deals with some of the hard to abate sectors. You can run blast furnaces on it. You potentially might be able to fly. You could certainly drive ocean steamers, uh, long range uh, cargo transport with hydrogen. And if you do the map, and the crucial thing here is the cost threshold, and you look at that map of the world and where solar and wind resources are, it's, you cannot escape the conclusion that the African continent is the place to do the extraordinarily energy intensive process. One of the things we have to get used to with the energy transition is doing things in ridiculously inefficient ways. It's far more efficient to get some high grade petrol and burn it in a super efficient German or Japanese engine to generate power that it is to split molecules, create hydrogen, then liquefy the, you know, it's an insanely elaborate process for which you need vast amounts of dirt cheap electricity. And what this map is telling you is that this continent is God's chosen location for dirt cheap electricity. The problem, of course, is the investment that's necessary. I'll say more about that in a second. This is, again, is a hardcore reality. This is not, you know, a pie in the sky, uh, uh, imaginary stuff. We are well beyond that. We are well beyond the blueprint stage. Money is going to start going into the ground on a very large scale in these obvious locations on the northwestern corner, Mauritania and Morocco, Namibia and South Africa and Egypt. And these with Kenya have formed the African Green Hydrogen Alliance, which met at the Green Hydrogen Global Assembly in Barcelona. There's an entire political superstructure of green energy forming right now in which things like a hydrogenous global hydrogen assembly exist and a new kind of pan-Africanism, a new kind of or at least coalitional politics can take shape that is going to drive, we hope, they hope, the models tell you it must be tens if not hundreds of billions of uh, dollars worth of investment uh, going forward. These are the building blocks of a future which doesn't simply involve locking Africa into a low, uh, a low energy consumption equilibrium. It is, of course, hugely question begging. We should talk about that in the break. At the third level, private carbon credits, hydrogen, the third level is what you have to describe as a kind of revival of big D developmentalism. Ever since 2015 and the Sustainable Development Goals, this is what these number, where these numbers come from, that have been very smart, very well-intentioned, very well-motivated people just like us all around the world, setting their minds to the question of answering the question we started with. Okay, we're going to do the energy transition. We're going to do it for everyone. How much is it going to cost? How much do we actually need? And this team, so with Vera Songwe, uh, Lord Stern, and uh, Bhattacharya, um, who is a leading Indian uh, World Bank development economist, have produced the latest one of these uh, of these estimates. It's it's fired. It's this very weird hybrid kind of document. It's the most clunky, technocratic, big D development. They literally call it a big push, as though we were in the 1950s. Um, but it's fired by this sense that right now, right here, in these months, in these years, because we are talking at this point about quarters, things have to change on a quarterly cycle. History is beside, being decided, nothing less than that. The same sense of David Wallace Wells, that like we hang in the balance, humanity hangs in the balance and we must act. What it depends on is, well, you know, about a trillion dollars. 
Their best estimate as to what the emerging market and low income countries need in the world to achieve development is not a trillion dollars once, not a hundred billion dollars once, a trillion dollars extra on top of what we currently do per annum going forward and then increasing. So over the next five to six to seven years, an extra one trillion and then going out from there to closer to two trillion a year. Now, remember, that sounds like a panicky large number. But remember, global GDP is 85 trillion. So what we're really asking for here is $2 trillion. And this isn't money sunk in the ground. This isn't aid in any simple sense of the word. This is investment, but you have to mobilize it and you have to direct it. So this is what their blueprints are all about. How do you build the structure that will generate um, those extra trillions per annum? And they have a roadmap for it. This is called not the big push. It's called the great match. And the great match is a matching of Investment needs, so we need an extra trillion dollars or 957 billion per annum against potential sources of funding. And if you dig into this and look carefully at what they're really saying is what you need on the one hand is the Global North public balance sheet to de-risk private investment to the point where an extra third of a trillion will flow towards the emerging market in low-income countries. And then to sustain that and ultimately enable repayment of those debts, you need the building of powerful fiscal states in the developing countries that are able to generate the tax revenue. And if this sounds familiar, and sounds as though we're flogging a dead horse, that's kind of my point. We have clearly been here before. Um, but the context that we're talking about is now framed within this question of, uh, uh, of addressing the, the fundamental uh, climate crisis. So out of the 957 billion that we think we need, 77% is either going to come through a fiscal revolution in the developing world, Oh, it's going to come through both a fiscal revolution in the developing world, and you might say a public finance revolution in the West as well. And this is what somebody like Daniel Lagarbo, and I'm speaking less from the development world here, from the critical macro finance world that I, that I come from. Um, this is the apotheosis, you might say, of this trajectory that moves from age-based development spending to development finance through billions into trillions agenda of 2015 and afterwards towards what Daniela calls the Wall Street consensus, not the Washington consensus, get it? So the point is that this is not about the rectification of public finance so much as the harnessing of public finance in both the developing world and the rich country world to enable massive private financial flows to circulate because it involves de-risking on both sides. The borrowers have to be competent to sustain the debts over the long run they have to be in domestic currency. We all know the shtick. And on the other hand, the rich countries have to provide the, the subsidy element that's necessary. And we know what the objections are, right? But this is, as it were, our world's best guess as to how we go forward from here to get the hydrogen stuff done, to get this development trajectory done. This is the scale. This is the architecture. The questions are distribution of risks and benefit within the de-risking patron states, distribution of same within the developing countries which take this on, who sets the terms, who exercises power, who's actually in control of these contracts. Do the civil service establishments, both on the lending and on the borrowing side, have the competence to oversee the contracts? Who develops competence over time dynamically? And where does this position you in the global division of labor? We can all do this for crying out loud. Every single person in this room who's done development studies can get you, it's a declination. It's an almost grammatical exercise. We know how this goes. This is one set of worries, and this is Daniela's chief worry. Another set of worries is why would you want to incorporate Africa into what is already a broken Western financial system? So Vera Zongwe, who is leading the charge on this, her main project is a thing called the uh, Liquidity and Sustainability Fund. And that is, did you not, a, a, a market making mechanism to create a repo market for African sovereign debt with a view to increasing its liquidity. Now we can understand why you would want greater liquidity, but you literally only have to watch what's going on in New York this week to see how dangerous a repo-based financial system could be for the richest, richest quote unquote country in the world, let alone a stressed sovereign bonder in the developing world. There are two views of this, I think. One is the vision that I think many of my folks in the critical macro finance world inhabit, which is to say, this is the giant uh, steamroller of global financial capitalism in its latest incarnation coming to gobble the world and eat it all up. Right? That is one way of thinking about this. And so our efforts ought to be directed towards fighting it, resisting it, redirecting it, pushing it towards a more developmentalist state. I have to say my own personal worry 
is that in fact, it's toothless wishful thinking. My big worry is not that it gets done and then we lose the struggle over the political economy of the mechanism when it works. My big worry is it's always a sort of manicured vision, utopian vision of the world in Polanyan terms that never actually gets delivered. Because just look at the trajectory of lending to Africa over the last 10 years in which the blending finance model, the euro bond market model, the private finance mechanism plus China have been running at full steep. That's the flow on the left-hand side. Those ladies and gentlemen are figures denominated in tens of billions. And then see what happens in, since 2020, and it collapses to near zero. It'll probably be negative this year. The scale of the ask on the right-hand side, broken down to Africa, not for the whole emerging market world, is not $1 trillion, but in the order of 200 to 300 billion a year. So we are a factor of five to six out, five to six times more is needed than has ever been delivered by this mechanism before. That, to me, is the really serious concern here. And what do we believe? Do we seriously believe that there is a realistic prospect on the timeline of, the, of climate change, on the timeline of Africa's demographic revolution of the next 20 to 30 years, of a major adjustment, and the critical variable here is Nigeria, a huge surge in Nigeria's tax to GDP ratio? Surely not. That is, that is not part of a realistic world. So now I hope I've swung you back into this space of kind of irrealism, which these, these, these serious-minded efforts to calculate and map this world uh, inevitably point you towards. So we're back at the beginning. What kind of a world are we in, in which it seems sensible to make these kind of, ask these kind of questions? We have answers to almost all of them. What kind of world is it that we're, that we're, that we're, that we're caught in? Now, I was, I was mulling this, I was mulling this question this morning uh, when I got a text from a friend in the, in the White House. And I got a text from a friend in the White House, and this is somebody I know from doing the research for writing my book, Crash, which was about the financial crisis of 2008. So this is a guy who was a veteran of the Obama Treasury, who was talkative, he was walking at BlackRock at the time as a major figure there. Let's just call him Mike for sake of, for sake of simplicity. And Mike sends me a text saying, Adam, I really need to, to talk to you. This was this morning as I was finishing these slides. That's why it's in this. And I think, yeah, Mike wants to talk to me. I mean, obviously, Mike wants to talk to me about the meltdown of the American banking system. Like, clearly, that's, that's what we have in common. That's how we got to know each other. And it turns out that that isn't what Mike wanted to talk to me about. What Mike wanted to talk to me about was this, because Mike's brief in the White House has been lead negotiator of America's relations with Europe over the last two years, which is why he's wanted to talk to me, because I know the people on the European side quite well and give him a kind of impression of what's going on in Berlin and Paris, which is very different from what they show people from the White House. So he launches into this. And I think, wow, this is weird. Then he says, you know, Adam, what was really strange is that on Friday last week, Silicon Valley Bank went bust. And the thing that really didn't get covered was that Ursula von der Leyen sat down with President Biden to agree the future of the green energy transition at a global level. And I'm really worried that people aren't noticing and I want you to know, so I want to brief you on this. And I go, Mike, that's really fascinating. This is great. I mean, this is almost this reality I'm describing to you, like hitting me in the face, right? The banks are melting down, the repo market's now functioning. And I've got this guy literally in the White House from BlackRock saying, I want to brief you on this stuff. And this is what they're relating to. So there was a meeting on Friday around the, around the, around the fireplace in the White House and out of it came, a joint European-American initiative to address precisely the world that we've been talking about. Begin, negotiated on target, uh, begin negotiations on targeted critical minerals agreement, clean energy incentives to avoid the American plans clashing with the European ones and having a trade war, Trade and Technology Council now to coordinate action against China directly. Um, the global agreement on sustainable steel and aluminium is now actually going to be finished by October. The G7 partnership for global infrastructure and investment is going to be revived. And they're going to do something about the World Bank and its inadequate lending. And I know the first bits of the agenda, so I begin to focus in on the bottom bits. And I say, Mike, you know, what is this thing about the Global Infrastructure Partnership? I had to kind of look that up. I'd forgotten about it. I had some dim kind of memory. And it turns out this is a deal that they did back in June 2021, where they announced at the G7, this was immediately post-Trump, that they were going to have, here are the buzzwords, value-driven, high-impact, transparent infrastructure partnership to meet the enormous infrastructure needs of lower middle-income countries. That sounds good, right? Transparent, so it's not corrupt, pro-democratic, so it's not like the Chinese. This sounds like a great package. And so then a year later, they delivered this. Today, President Biden will announce that the US aims to mobilize 
$200 billion for PGII over the next five years through grants, federal financing, and leveraging private sector investment. Together with the G7 partners, $600 billion over five years. And a year later, it's the White House texting twos to say, hey, remember the PGII, literally, uh, this morning. $600 billion over five years. You can now, everyone in this room can do the math, right? It's, it's not even in the ballpark of where we need to be, right? $600 billion over five years, $40 billion for the US, uh, is $40 billion for the US per annum, or $120 billion for the entire rich country world together. That is six, uh, one sixth, or perhaps one seventh of an optimistic estimate of what will be available for this big push. And I can't bring it to you any more directly than this. This is the math. Mike is an incredibly numerate guy. He's from BlackRock, for crying out loud. Now he's in the White House. And he's read this report. And he knows we need to be in the ballpark of a trillion a year. And he is excitingly texting me to say, Adam, we've delivered 120 billion, maybe, sort of as a promise. The thing I can commit to is 40. And that's the sort of uneasiness and perplexity that I want to leave you, leave you with. Like, I, I can't, I mean, people accuse me of being too interested in too close to power. You don't get any close to power, certainly as a normal civilian without security clearance, than this text exchange, right? This is literally the inside of global capitalism, sitting in the White House, doing the math and saying, this is as much as we can do. So I'm led back to uh, this diagram and I'm driven to ask another question which is of a more existential variety because I find this stuff existential which is who are we and are we for real the people who know this who can see these numbers who do these exercises who send texts back and forth to each other saying I need to brief you on this thing we just agreed with the Europeans what are, who are we here right if you look at Wallace Wells's account his version of history is all contested, combative, combining, suffering and flourishing. It's this big drama, right? It's this big upbeat drama of history that we're now going to dig in and deal. But if you have any remotely realistic account of history, like I've been constantly invoking Chekhov in the last 48 hours in South Africa. At this point, I'm thinking more of Tolstoy. Like if you have any remotely realistic account of history, you know it's full, not just of combat, suffering, struggle, Right? It's also full, and no one needs to lecture anyone in South Africa about this, that that narrative of suffering and struggle can easily morph into something that's dominated by hypocrisy, cynicism, fatalism, cognitive dissonance, perversity, short-termism, collective action failure, organized irresponsibility, and self-deception. And those are the polite words for the condition that you can find yourself in. And that's kind of the question that I'm left with. That I'd be out of here is one that takes me to a space I'm not actually very comfortable with as a humanities scholar. If I'm going to leave you on an optimistic note, I go back to these two graphs. There's something about this that compels me. There's something about the combination of wind and sun on this continent and in other parts of the world. And there's something about that cost curve that compels me. That seems to me to be a powerful argument. When I step back and inhabit the world that I'm actually most comfortable with, when I'm texting back and forth with my friend Mike, I actually feel kind of lost. Thank you very much. So uh, that was the exceptional Adam Tooze, who is able to uh, to move from uh, massive uh, uh, finance to all of the complexities of 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 kind of climate change and kind of in kind of into the White House itself. So thank you so much for that, Adam. I think we're just gonna open it up straight straight for any thoughts for kind of any questions people have. I think given Adam's style, I think I'm going to 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 take one question at a time. So you have have um you you kind of have the time to engage with it. What we I'd like to do is take one question from kind of inside the room move to those online take take one there and then come uh, 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 back to the room so I'm going to start with the gentleman there and then I'll come to you chippy in in the next round okay uh, professor Toos, thank you very much for that roller coaster ride uh, what seemed to me absent in your analysis and you're probably not going to be able to address this quickly, is your focus was primarily on the plans being made 
in Europe and America. And surely the elephant in the room is China. So why didn't you give equal treatment to China since it's maybe even the major player, particularly for us here in Africa? Uh, so yeah, just over to you. No, that's a that's a brilliant question. Um, and absolutely correct, and you're, you're right, in a different version of that talk, this talk. Um, would have centered on on China. I, I wanted to I wanted to convey a flavor of the uh, I wanted in this talk to convey a flavor of the um, the quality of the conversation, the way it's been conducted, and that's obviously far easier as an outsider in the European and American context, where to some extent I actually have inside access to the process than it, than I than it'll ever be for me in China. So there's part it was it was partly because I wanted this talk to end where it did on this somewhat kind of existential personal note because i think this is a topic which demands to be treated in that level which which um which meant that i steered the way i did you know if you add europe and the united states up they are two-thirds of the chinese problem but uh, you, one could give a completely different version of this paper um of this of an answer to this question which simply said um the people who have to answer this question are the people in beijing Right. But China is now responsible for 29% of global emissions by itself. So it's far more dominant than the United States or Europe individually ever were. China emits more than um, the combined emissions of all of the rich countries in the world. Uh, it has a per capita emission now, which is higher than most of Europe. Historically, it's about to overtake Europe. So at that point, the two key pillars of climate justice arguments will shift quite dramatically. It still won't be true that on average over time, the average Chinese matches the average European, but you see where I'm headed. But China becomes the center of this whole thing. And in terms of Europe and America's understanding of the world, you know, we wait, we even argue with each other about whether China will ever overtake the United States in terms of GDP per capita. But in the climate space, it's done and dusted. The argument's over. China has demonstrated what industrial economic development looks like in a way that no other group of humans ever has in the history of our species. I mean, they pour in a matter of two to three years more concrete than America in the entire 20th century. Their coal-fired power station fleet alone generates more emissions than the entire American energy system. Like it, we're, we're, It's a different space. And the humiliating, humiliating sobering, realistic implication for Western thinking about the world is that on this issue, on this central issue for our future, our children's and grandchildren's future, for the first time in several hundred years, the West no longer holds its destiny in its own hands. Full stop. End of story. We can influence it one way or the other, this course of the path, but the fundamental organizing idea of Eurocentric conceptions of history, which ultimately was that we were the actor that drove things for better and for worse. There's both a critical and a, and a celebratory version of this is obsoleted by this. And you could say that I perpetuated that this evening with a view to, as it were, making it as, as, as intimate as possible. I, I also bracketed them because, because, of the, because of the assumption that comes out of that work by Mercure and, and others, right? The, 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 I don't think there's any serious reason to doubt, well, let's say, my views about the Beijing regime were shaken very badly by the vaccine debacle. But if we can bracket that and assume that the Beijing is broadly speaking a rationally motivated, long range authoritarian regime operating a society of 1.4 billion plus on a much thinner margin of ecological you know, resource and comfort than anywhere in the West, China's not there in India's space, and it's not there in parts of Africa's space in terms of climate vulnerability, but nor is it the Midwest of the United States, obviously. Why would we doubt for a single second that Beijing and Xi Jinping in particular are deadly serious when they say that they are going to aim for climate stabilization by or uh, 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 carbon neutrality by 2060? Why would we doubt that? This is not a concession they make to Western opinion to somehow curry favor with us, to somehow please the German government. That's absurd. They're doing it because the climate problem is deadly serious. And they need to stabilize. And their problem now is to bring other people along with them and to reverse the ruinous one belt, one road investment programs, many of which notably say in Pakistan, were incredibly carboniferous. And they need to pull that back. And I think they're changing gear and trying to figure out where they go. But look across the entire sector. If you look at wind, if you look at solar, if you look at renewable, uh, if you look at EVs, the Chinese dominate that. If you look at nuclear, the Chinese dominate the nuclear story. Sure, they also build a lot of coal-fired power stations, more than the entire rest of the world combined, but they have an energy fragility problem. 
like the Europeans. It's chronic, it's really unstable. In 2021, their electricity system almost collapsed. And so where they go, their safe space when they're stressed is coal and they add coal capacity. It's not obvious that they use it. So it's not a given that you build a power station, you actually get high utilization. And that's been the problem of the Chinese power sector for some time. It's chronically unprofitable. So the, the other reason I bracketed this was that I take it to be a kind of actually fairly un, not unproblematic, but one of the motors that's going to drive this. And they crush the long run outlook for the fossil fuel market globally, right? Because they have been the driver of global oil. What the deal that they've just done with the Iran Iranians and the Saudis, I think, is part of smoothing their off ramp. They don't want any problems there. They don't want the Americans messing in there. But this shows, I think, how actively energy is incorporated into the Chinese decision making set, how seriously they take this. So that's by way of making up for the omission. Um, it's not. Uh, it, it's it's not it's 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 pivotal and it lurks in the background of everything that's going on now uh, in the West. You saw it also with regard to I mean this is the one-eyed optic with which Europe and the Americans. I mean, the Europeans see Africa through two cynical optics. One is China, and the other one is migration. Right, they're terrified of the demographic the demographic bomb, and the Americans see China Africa overwhelmingly through the geopolitical struggle. And to a, I mean, not to say to a fault is. So the other state it. It's really an astonishingly one-dimensional read. Um, all right, let's let's then shift uh, kind of online for a question, and I'm going um, I'm going to move to Julia to pick out a question from our online uh, uh, from uh, from those who are uh, from those who are online. Over to you, Julia. Thank you. So there's a question from Ben Bradlow who says. Yeah. How do you understand the international unevenness of the emerging global green industrial complex? To what extent can these investments be mobilized without throwing up protectionist barriers that lock out middle income countries like South Africa from moving up the global value chain in a sector like, for example, auto manufacturing? Yes. Yeah. Uh, ben, ben is a Twitter friend, I think. Um, that was what I was pointing towards, in a sense, with the Polanyan scenario. I polarized this as saying there was you know, likely to be a European-American standoff. The Americans would be in the position of the resentful outcome of fossil fuel producer that would retreat into isolationism. Um, that's not as crazy as it sounds. If you look at the history of the American oil industry in the 50s and 60s, because the American oil industry is schizophrenic. One part of it is the mega, the mega corporations, which were dominating the Middle Eastern supply. But they weren't allowed to export oil from the Middle East to the United States. And the United States operated in a high oil price bubble in the 50s and 60s to support the wildcatters in Texas, who were small, inefficient producers. Um, the difference for consumers was made up by the fact that Americans don't pay any tax on petrol. And so even if they were buying more expensive oil, the refineries were nevertheless selling petrol more cheaply than in Europe or Japan that were buying the Middle Eastern oil pumped by the American companies. So America has a track record of creating isolated spaces of fossil fuels, I see no reason to think that they'll be any different this time around. And the European American intent on steel and aluminium is absolutely explicit. That's the plan, is to create a block into which you can only sell at the expense and the price of various types of carbon levy. The Europeans and Americans are acutely aware of the pushback from the developing and middle income world, and they will bargain, negotiate, strategize, tactically employ that. The main target is none of those countries, it's China. And that's that's the fundamental logic here. And people, people in Brussels, Berlin, Paris, Washington, see the problem of middle income country competitors coming and will try and use that strategically. I think the the Just Energy Transition Partnership, in part, is a proactive effort to get around the back of that, right? So that if you can create a power sector for South African industry that is, in fact, green, decouple it from the failing ESCOM system, then you're actually avoiding this problem uh, and stepping around it. What we've seen from the Inflation Reduction Act, and it's really interesting, is that you know it wasn't administration policy. I'm just exciting it because it's a concrete example of green protectionism in action already and it's the biggest so far, it has all of these home domestic content rules. You don't qualify for full subsidy unless you make the car in the United States or if its battery components are sourced from within the safe space the Americans have defined. And, and 
we shouldn't be confused. This was not a deliberate policy on the part of the Biden administration. This was the only thing they could get through Congress. And so they passed it. What they have done since, entire teams of people in the Biden administration have since been using that, that um, turd, frankly, of a piece of legislation, which deeply upset both the South Koreans and the Europeans as, as they would say, leverage for achieving positive sub outcomes. You know, which is a way of saying, look, if we can find a way around this, can we get something else from you? Which is what they're doing, what this latest announcement on the 10th of March is all about. It's literally spawned out of a transatlantic working group for figuring out how to unglue the nightmare created by the Inflation Reduction Act, which is Joe Manchin's, you know, monster baby. I often think of that when I think of Gramsci and, you know, this is a time of monsters. If you want to see a piece of monstrous legislation, it's Joe Manchin and the Inflation Reduction Act. So that is the way I think it's going to play out. I don't think it's, this is not an inevitable story. You can, the tensions are there. And so the interests of emerging market and low income developing countries must be to fight to insert themselves, to push back. Um, that is that's that's a recipe for for mixed outcomes and for struggle. And there's very little in the past track record, particularly on agriculture, to fill one with huge amounts of hope. But at this stage, at least, it's all still to play for. And these sectoral deals. Let me, let me add one final point. Like the what is broken is in the global trading system is not just as it were the domestic impetus to do these kind of deals and to drive green energy policy this way but also all of the multilateral grand grandiose mechanisms for resolving these kind of disputes the wto is dead and the americans have declared it dead when the wta found against them they basically sent off a short missive saying the fact that you have found against us demonstrates that you're historically obsolete and in need of radical reform Literally, in so many words. And this is a Biden administration responding to a finding on a Trump administration, crazy piece of national security inspired protectionism. So there is no patience on the American side for this. So the way to redress, the way to bargain is not by way of appeals to those multilateral mechanisms. It's by way of exploiting local strategic significance. Uh, moral suasion, mobilization of public opinion, of interest groups, which, and this is why these sectoral deals are so important, the Just Energy Transition Partnership, the European Partnership with the Namibians, for instance, over hydrogen, and the devil is in the detail on each one of those single deals. This is where we were nodding back and forth to each other about blended finance, right? In principle, it might not be a totally obnoxious idea, but the problem is the fine print and the lawyering is so intense on the wrong side. The people who you're playing with are so empowered. You know, you're doing one of these deals with a major global energy company or a major, uh, a major, a major, a major a global bank. You you need to power up, and you need to be you need to mobilise all possible uh, forms of countervailing power that you can, up to and including popular mobilisation, so as to level the playing field. And that's that's where the the fight's going to be. It isn't going to be in WTO suits or something like that has to be around that kind of mobilization. So make it difficult for them, make it tough, make them pay, embarrass them, shame them, force the issue that way. And in the end, I think geography, which is why I ended up in that space, the geography and the technology of this are just so compelling. Um, those are really strong cards. Great, let's uh, um, um, move, move on then to Crispin. Uh, hi there, Adam. It's Crispian Olver. I'm uh, from the Climate Commission in South Africa. Uh, and th thank you for an incredibly stimulating talk. It, it really, I mean, the, the way you sketched out ge global geopolitics around this transition is fascinating. Um, I want to pick up from w w this last point that you were replying to and, and ask. Uh, basically how you see the global trade restrictions linked to carbon evolving you know we've been following the cbam very closely i mean it's 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 a big issue for south africa uh, two thirds of our vehicles uh, are exported mm -hmm. uh, and most of those go to europe uh, it's going to affect our iron and steel sector fertilizers cement yeah. uh, we're going to be hit quite hard by it and, you know, I know there's a bit of pushback. The U.S. Uh, doesn't like CBAM, they, but they, you know, every country that signed on to a net zero target 
is going to want to stop leakage in one form or another. Mm. Um, so can you just take a little bit of a blue sky conjectural uh, take on, you know, how you think these instruments will evolve over time? Is it, you know, as simple as saying there's going to be a global carbon price at some point, or is this going to be in a far more fragmented, yes. almost set of bilateral deals? Uh, this is an absolutely fascinating question. So let me add another layer of, com of complexity. And thank you for coming, seriously, for taking the time. Uh, um, <laughs> you've got a lot of important business um, to do. Um, to add another layer of complexity here, um, you know, one of the evolving tendencies in the global trading system is not just towards various types of regionalization, a move away from the classic tariffs as the basic source of protectionism, a move away from the WTO as the multilateral, the classic multilateral forum in which trade deals are transacted. Another key element that I think defines part of the answer to your question is who or what trades, right? And, and globally, and, and it's crucial to be realistic about how the vast majority of trade flows are organized. And the, and the, and, and the, simple, answer, the simple point to make about that is one can't generalize, right? Because it varies by sector, and what varies by sector is the way within each sector, corporate power and corporate supply chain strategies vary. So if you look around the world right now, if you think about globalization since the 1990s, you could compare three different models by sector. So there's textiles, for instance, which is relatively simple produce, and it's a series of relatively flat networks that radiate, radiate out overwhelmingly from China, which still today is where the spinning and the designing is done, and then to a series of manufacturing nodes in Bangladesh, uh, uh, preeminently, but also the rest of uh, Southeast Asia. So that's one model of globalization. And that does fit much more in the kind of WTO tariffs kind of bucket. Another form of globalization is, um, you know, this, the thing that we all hold dear. So this is maybe humanity's most sophisticated mass-produced product ever, literally in the history of our species. It is an absolutely astonishing artifact, and it depends on a network and a supply chain that kind of combines the quality of just-in-time Toyotaism with the raffinesse of French winemaking from Burgundy. In other words, there's only one place in the world that they have the sophistication to make chips at the highest level, and they literally need a specialist to do it, and it's in a couple of factories in Taiwan. And nowhere else in the world has even come close to being able to replicate that in the same way as you cannot make Burgundy wine anywhere else in the world, however hard you try, because it depends on terroir, like this weird amalgam. And then you harness that to a series of megacorp connections, which are nationally promiscuous. So they are US on China, China on South Korea, Taiwan on South Korea, Japan on US, Dutch on South Korea. So they constantly cross national boundaries. That's the maximum point of vulnerability for the current disruption, because the supply chain itself is hyper unbelievably astronomically complex, and it is totally promiscuous in terms of national alignment. The car industry, which you single out, is really interesting because it's neither one of those two models. The car industry is preeminently the model of oligopolistic global regionalization. So it's all about the corporate strategy of how VW or BMW, I don't know who I should know, but I don't know who the major players are in South Africa. But it's those are the actors that decide this. Whether you have a CBAM problem will crucially depend on whether VW wants you to have a CBAM problem or not, because VW can make it go away by reorganizing their supply system so as to put you on the right side of the fence. Right? What they're going to do with the geopolitics, I'm convinced, is segment, segment, segment. So if you look at the mapping of the global supply chain for auto, it is super regionalized. So if you're building cars in China, you don't really export a lot of stuff to anywhere else. You say, take supply chain within that zone, and you can segment that off. And I think this is VW's back gamble with having their factory in Xinjiang, right? It is obviously a huge hazard to them that they think they can isolate that off as a separate element. So I would, as a, in South Africa's position or Poland's position or Hungary's position, your leverage has got to be crucially not just on other governments, but on the corporations that are making these strategic decisions because they govern how you are inserted into this system. And what you want to do ideally, I guess, is position yourself as favored partners. I mean, where else are they going to get cheaper sources of wind and solar power if you can get the infrastructure up? 
than here. It's, you know, forget intermittency, you're in the right parts of this country, you just don't have that problem. So that is, as it were, the, the card to, to play on. But it, do, it crucially involves bringing this other group of actors in who in classic international trade theory, where we think of economies on economies with comparative advantage dictating what goes on, just never figure in the equation. It's the, for, for, for that kind of thing, it's crucially about corporates. So you need, as it were, your strategy then becomes a kind of, you don't want to fall into the position of doing what's it called industrialization by invitation or something like that, begging the corporate world to locate. But you need a strategy that, that, that axes on, on their decision-making internally. And that's where all of, I think, the action is going to be, especially in, in auto. Great, let's move back. Uh, let's move uh, uh, back to those online. Julia? Thanks. So there's a question from Mbali Baduza, who says, Prof, what do you think about South Africa's hypocrisy as both Africa's largest emitter and the most unequal country. What does responsibility for such a country look like, especially for climate refugees? Yeah, I mean, South Africa's position is, I mean, we've been having this conversation consistently for the last two days. And, and um, I mean, it's absolutely unique, right? It's absolutely unique in the combination of, um, of having a, it's beyond middle income, a advanced economy, 1970s, 1980s era generator set on the coal side. That's been renewed, but the underlying design, the underlying conception stems from that period. I mean, not for nothing, South Africa was also a pioneer of hydrogenation and, and synthetic fuel production. In fact, they employed um, cohorts of German engineers who were coming out of the Third Reich synthetic fuel program um, to achieve autarky. So you have another way of analogizing this is you have like an energy infrastructure a little bit like that of Poland, or one of the communist states, heavily coal dependent, uh, fragile, and on the other hand, obviously, not just the domestic development problem and the legacies of disadvantage and poverty that result from that, but also rapid population growth compounded by, um, or youth bulge at least, compounded by, because the demographic transition is going ahead here quite dramatically, a youth bulge com uh, uh, combined with with migration and the tensions that have manifested themselves around that. I feel very shy about going much further than that in the in the presence of, of, of so many experts here and some really like you know formidable experts. But um it's a it's a clearly an acute problem on the one hand, and on the other hand, it does seem to be like the largest open goal in the global energy space. Like it's tragic, but also. I mean, there's just an obvious solution, right? I mean, it's a matter of substantial investment in various forms of decentralized renewable as quickly as they can be brought into production and online and as quickly as you can finesse the domestic politics, which I don't need to tell anyone in this room, are hugely fraught and complex, which is why the just energy transition is a real issue for South Africa. With the unemployment rates that you have, you know, the, the issue of mine labor, which in Europe, I think, is, is absolutely extraordinary. It's a mouse like confronting and terrifying an elephant. Germany, you will not believe this, but Germany is paying 25,000 mine workers, a combined total of 40 billion euros to exit the industry. 25,000 mine workers, 40 billion euros. Now that is a gold-plated just transition, right? That is not a model that can be replicated anywhere else in the world. So South Africa's trade-offs, I mean, I, it would seem completely inappropriate for me to engage on the issue of hypocrisy. There may be hypocrisy, there may not be, but what there certainly is, is a huge opportunity. And it's not by accident that the Just Transition Partnership people are axing in on this. As far as I know, from, from actually regular conversations with South African colleagues, the fundamental problem, apart from anything else, is to get buy-in on the transition program in your incredibly complex, for high-energy, high-intensity political system. That's... That's the key issue. Can you can the, can you actually build societal consensus around the trade-offs that are inevitable? Can you build the trust that will mean that people actually believe that the payoffs will come? It's a very tough problem. It's not unique. This was also the problem that haunted the Americans for a long time. In power political terms, the question is also not simply, um, you know, you can pose it as a sort of democratic one where you can have a kind of no person left behind type vision of the just transition. Personally, I find that very uncompelling as a realistic account. What you really need to do is build a very powerful green energy coalition that is going to force its way to the front of history and insist on change, and then ask perhaps 
who are the people that need to be bought off on on what terms. But that is the way in which, say, the Inflation Reduction Act finally passed in the United States. It was being killed in the way that American green legislation has been killed over and over again. And there was a moment of truth, and we know exactly when it happened. It started around the 14th of July, 2022. And all of a sudden, the green energy lobby in the United States realized, shit, we are going to again end up with no subsidy regime and no backing. And at this historic moment, that is unacceptable. We need a deal. And the lobbying shifted, the power of the American business lobby shifted behind the green energy program. And that is a key element of this. It's then, it's then tough, it's bare knuckles politics. There are not, not everyone will be followed along. There will be winners and losers in that process. But the, the, the power political question is, as it were, what is the winning coalition? What is the dominant coalition? How do you shift the balance of power such that the green energy coalition can neutralize, outflank, ultimately defeat its opponents? And then in South Africa, I know that's a very tall order and a very dangerous game to be playing. Uh, thank you, Adam. Let's um, 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 move on to that side to Mohammed. I'm going to allow one more online question and then one more. I'm going, going to go to that uh, camp to the lay to uh, camp to the lady there. Uh, to be fair, Adam's been going for almost uh, 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 kind of two hours, and I think we would we, kind of we 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 might have to stop there. But let's start with Mohammed. Uh, thank you for the fascinating talk, Adam. So my question is: What are the implications of the U.S.-China tech war on energy and things? And the other way of Putting the question is, is the tech war a proxy war for energy? Are they fighting for energy through this tech war? It's a really fascinating question. Um, and it adds to the sort of perplexity of our current moment. So it's another one of those, you know, a bit like my opening, like it's another one of these processes that are going on us all around us right now, which at the one level just seem unfathomably unrealistic and unimaginable and yet everything tells you it walks like a trade war it walks like you know it talks like a new cold war it quacks like a new cold war at some point you've just got to say this is actually and it's not even clear it's a cold war there is a very realistic prospect of military outright military confrontation between the united states and china full stop and you should take everything that you hear about that every report really at face value and seriously the the, the mood in both camps is massively polarized so and these two things come together what what's happened on the american side is that they sort of segued and they but they're on twin tracks they're not fully merged right so the chip war is a china confrontation story and somewhat implausibly because this is not really where they started out the climate issue is a sort of china issue but it isn't climate climate politics so when kerry goes to cop 26 27 on the sidelines they're talking to the chinese all the time he knows the chinese negotiator now for 15 to 20 years they're quite good buddies they get along well they try to silo the climate issue in that sense but when it comes to industrial policy when it's about jobs when it's about industrial power when the word strategy enters the picture all of a sudden batteries, for heaven's sake, and electric vehicles become this strategic issue. What we haven't, I think, so far quite seen is an argument that merges tech. So that would be a common factor, antagonism with China driving both green and tech. I don't think we've yet quite seen the spark jumping across from the tech to the climate thing, unless maybe somebody can put me right here, but I'm, I'm not quite seeing that yet. Um, Obviously, tech will be required to efficiently manage the green energy transition and a lot of very sophisticated technology. But I don't think any of that is quite at the level of chip making the Americans are really worried about. Maybe at the artificial intelligence level, there will be something there. You do see the Americans, of course, leery about the presence of Chinese infrastructure in energy infrastructure in large parts of the world. They're extremely anxious about that. The most egregious connection I've seen made so far came over the weekend with, in the lobbying over Silicon Valley Bank. So just hang with me here because this is tortured logic. Silicon Valley Bank is the house bank of City Bank Valley, makes the world go around there, makes pays their bills, is the house bank. It gets in trouble for reasons we don't need to go into. So when they go lobby to get a rescue, the, the depositors go lobby to Washington. What's their opening move? 
their opening move is, this isn't a bank. Their opening move is to deny that what's at stake here is a bank bailout. What is at stake here is a tech bailout, an innovation bailout, and here's the link, an anti-China bailout, because without us, we can't mount an effective defense against China. So a, uh, a, 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 a banking crisis gets morphed into a national security crisis. Now, if that can happen, it seems to me there's virtually nothing that couldn't get morphed that way. Another group lobbying on behalf of Silicon Valley were the American solar tech businesses, all of whom bank with Silicon Valley Bank too. And so this uh, maybe the point I'm making is simply this virus is out there, this meme is out there, this mode of making connections between policy spaces is out there. It can only be a matter of time, given the stakes and given the valence, the salience of this in American politics right now, before all of the sparks jump, and we really do have that convergence. So far, I think it's still pretty much twin track. Right, um, let's go for one last round to, uh, to those online. Julia? So the um, the question is from Bliss Greer, um, and it's kind of the reason I'm reading this one is because there've been a few questions in a similar theme, kind of the role of Africa in all of this okay. in African countries. The question is: It seems that Africa is rich with resource, but doesn't seem to have a seat at the table, and appears more so a pawn. I think you've touched on this, but what more can we do to have some level of control over our future in the climate crisis? <laughs> Okay, I feel I feel I feel very humbled. Like I, I really think that is not my job. Um, um, I, I mean, I, I mean that very sincerely. Like, how, where would I get off making that, giving that kind of advice? Um, well, I think what what is, yeah. I mean, I mean, come on, let's be honest. Look, look at the way, look at the way, like Biden's Africa summit played out. And there was no, there was no apparently no effective prior communication with the African Union. There was very little bilateral reach out. Senior African diplomat, uh, diplomats and and very major players in African politics essentially felt they were be, being treated to some sort of herd show of African African figures in Washington. Um, that is, I think, an indication of the fact that there is a huge problem, and the, this perception is is quite right. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like weapon, arm up, like the uh, weaponized intelligence, weaponized expertise, weaponize the formidable talent pool that there is there, and weaponize the space that everyone knows Africa should occupy. Like it's, you cannot, it goes back to this sort of issue of like, what do we take realistic? What is realistic here? And a cynic would say Africa's marginalization, systematic, structural, uh, uh, discrimination and uh, peripheralization is the only thing to be realistic about. And I, I totally see where anyone coming, you know, would, would, would start in that position. But I think it's also unrealistic to say there isn't a giant space, actually, for African voices, for African leadership, for African argument, for African mobilization that needs to be filled. And it's very difficult for anyone in Europe or the United States to gain say that. So I think it's a sort of the question is whether you get to the, the you know, this, the example that comes to mind to a historian is the OPEC moment, the series of meetings and encounters between American and European oil diplomats and the Arab states as the Arabs geared up between 67 and 73. And that kind of encounter, that kind of reversal of the power balance is, is what's necessary. It goes back to an extent to a conversation that Keith and I were having, and forgive me to going for a very meta level here, because I feel profoundly uncomfortable to answering the question directly, given who I am and the accent I speak with. Just, But what really struck me, I was recently, I thought I would write like a, you know, a kind of easy come, easy go piece about Valentine's Day and Coco. And, you know, the story that's told about Coco today in the West on Valentine's Day in right thinking, liberal media, is a story about child labor an unequal exchange, right? That's as far as the conversation goes. If you dig into the history of Coco and Africa and visions of African sovereignty and national development, you discover, obviously, in the 1950s and 1960s, notably in Ghana, this supercharged, incredibly powerful conversation about that raw material ingredient and its capacity to empower African states for, for, for leverage and for action in the global system. 
And that is the level of conversation that we need to return to. And it is shockingly absent still in the current moment from global discourse. This is the one good thing I really do see in the hydrogen conversation, because that is an opportunity to mobilize that sense of African agency. The six states involved in that deal, at least four of them are very competent state apparatuses that can really exert leverage. Kenya is kind of, isn't such a state, but it's odd in this connection. So maybe we're only talking about three, but nevertheless, this is a powerful coalition and making that stick and exercising leverage there, that will be one of the places I would be looking for in the first instance. And, and yeah, so that, that I would really seriously focus resource, governmental resource expertise on making that into a partnership that is less unequal than it could obviously become, right? It's very easy to see how that becomes an exploitative one-way relationship. I mean, it's just a repetition of so many histories. All right, let's take the last question from you. Uh, hello, I'm sort of jumping from that previous question, but just getting a little more specific. I remember in the Daily Maverick article, you mentioned how the climate crisis is an issue of political economy and there's a lot of like um, social hierarchies and inequalities that are involved. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the COP27 carbon offsets that you talked yeah. about earlier, do you see potential for like an equal relationship or exchange between the African countries selling carbon offsets and the Western companies buying them? Or do you think that there's definitely going to be some sort of like Western dominance in that? I think that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think one should be suspicious of the carbon offsets for two reasons. One, from a climate perspective, they are a truly minimal kind of program, right? I mean, you are, you are essentially selling licenses, commodifying various types of existing natural service, it's often formulated as, to enable emissions in rich countries, right? That's effectively the, the trade that's taking place there. This is not as though, you know, a German firm is buying a certificate from a Polish power station. This is a, a trade which is hugely unequal um, in a substance. I mean, it's literally the deals of things like if you can move households from burning charcoal in their cooking to gas-fired stoves, that generates a credit that Netflix can buy. I mean, that's an obscene deal, right, to my mind. That's an, the people should have decent cooking facilities in any case, and those should be rapidly replaced by renewables, and this shouldn't be something. The, the logic is it's a kind of, it's a way of generating a revenue stream. Right? That's, that's why people find it attractive. It's something that Africa can export. The problem is it's a particularly toxic kind of export, but it's a, because it's a literally the right to pollute. Right. It's not, it's not, it's not, you know, fabulous textiles or, you know, tech services. It's literally the right to, to, to damage the environment that's being exported. The, 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 the only way in which that would seem to be remotely excusable is if they're indexed to whatever the most expensive carbon in the world is. Like, you know, if the Europeans are charging $100 or 100 euros per tonne of carbon, that's the price that Africa, could, Africa must exact too. Right? The worry has got to be, because this is the missing word in our discussion, is voluntary carbon trading schemes. These are voluntary programs in which, and this is non-trivial, American companies that want to be on the right side of history are buying these credits. Now, those same American companies could also be supercharging demand for solar panels in the United States. And many of them are. If you go across the red states of the United States, Kentucky, Tennessee, all of these places, wherever you can grow maize, wherever you can grow tobacco, you can do industrial solar. And so county by county, the major American corporations and the European electricity utilities are swinging red state counties to accept industrial solar. That's an actual positive step in the right direction. When the European company pays an African family for its new primer stove, I mean, this seems like, of course, there should, should be support for the improvement of cooking conditions for tens and thought hundreds of millions of people, but this deal just seems wrong. So that, that would be the two things. Like, why are we permitting this deal, this type of deal at all? And secondly, and secondly, what is the price? And that the second one is the most obvious indicator. If this is at market value in a compulsory system, then you could say, well, okay, it's convergence, right? If it's essentially some sort of discounted voluntary scheme, it seems to me prima facie, prima facie problematic. And especially if European companies are involved in this, who know perfectly well what they'd be paying at home. 
um, this is this is particularly problematic. I think that's all right. But, but Crispian, you may, I mean, you're in the thick of all of this. You may actually have, or other people in the room may have much better informed views about, was the South African government like particularly excited about carbon credits? Is that part of? You, you know, there, there's always been a skepticism about carbon credits and we, we, we missed the CDM wave. I mean, we, we did a bit of CDM. Um, uh, there was quite a lot of effort setting up a CDM unit in, 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 uh, within government. But by the time it was up and running and operational, CDM had already peaked and it was starting on the downhill curve. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I agree with your assessment. I mean, I think offsetting, uh, I mean, I wouldn't write offsetting off completely. Uh, I think what it can do is sort of just even out a, a carbon pricing mechanism and deal with some inefficiencies. So you can trade between you know, uh, sectors uh, and get the most optimum level of, right. of mitigation across the economy. But I, I, you know, I don't buy it as a primary means for driving mitigation. And, and your comment now just reminds me that I've never answered your question about a global carbon price. Um, it's not happening, I don't think. A global carbon price was absolutely the, you know, the kind of non plus ultra. The idea being that if you can set the carbon price right, then the markets will adjust and private producers will find the best way. This was the neoliberal, quintessentially, unapologetically celebratory neoliberal solution that came out of the United States with the Environmental Defense Fund. A, a Republican administration embraced it rolled it out, insisted on building it into the UN uh, treaties, laboriously negotiated it. And it just became clear already by the late 1990s that the United States Congress was never, ever, 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 ever going to sign up to a deal, however it's structured, whether it's a carbon tax or a carbon price, it just is not happening in American political space. And it's interesting, the opposition doesn't just come from the right, the opposition to agree comes from the American left, because one of the few places that the carbon price does operate is California. And in California, it's seen precisely as a license to pollute for the, you know, one of the most affluent group of people anywhere in the world. And they of course buy their tokens. Before there were Teslas, they would buy, they would buy, they would buy carbon credits in this system. So it became, it fell foul of a climate justice movement in the United States that was very centered on issues of racial inequality, notably in California on the West Coast, around pollution. And they began to regard this as this essentially um uh, uh yeah a, a mechanism for perpetuating inequality in the carbon space. And, and in the end, I think most people now feel that if you haven't got one, it's probably not worth the effort of trying to build a carbon market. You can get there through other mechanisms. But if you have got one, as the Europeans do, then let it rip, baby. Like tighten up the certification, drive that price high, because it does work. It has been, notably in the British case, Britain, which was the pioneer of coal-based industrialization, has had weeks and months now where it generates no power from coal largely as a result of a market-driven minimum carbon price, which they introduced, Gordon Brown's administration introduced in the early 2010s and the Tories inherited and has become quite a fixed point. So the mechanism is a good one, but you do have to make a serious political calculation about whether it's worth the pain, whether it's worth the pain and the cost. At a global level, no can do. Chinese and the Europeans might be able to arrange a deal between themselves, which would be a way around the CBAM system because the Chinese have a system, they in fact have the largest system in the world, it's operating pro forma, but it's the largest system in the world because it regulates their coal-fired power stations. And they are, as a block, by far and away, to go to your point, by far and away, the single largest emitter globally. All right, folks, I'm afraid we've, we've uh, come, come to the end of the time that we have for this, uh, uh, kind of for the seminar. Um, I have to thank a few, kind of a few people. So uh, thank you, uh, Thank you to Standard Bank. The, the kind of universities uh, uh, are being, being kind of supported uh, for a new chair on African futures by, by, by kind of Standard Bank. And Standard Bank's kindly supported uh, the, the, the uh, 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 cost to, to, kind of get, uh, to kind of have to can have Adam here. So thanks to uh, thanks to uh, thanks to uh, thanks to Standard Bank. I think it would be fair to say Adam would not have been here 
were it not for the uh, uh, for the work uh, for the work that Keith Brackenridge did to to get Adam here. Thank you so much, Keith, for thank you for all that. A number of uh, people in the university support services from our uh, kind of events team to the comms team to the I to the ICT team have supported us to to make uh, to make to make the the uh, uh, time seminar today possible. Thank you, thank you to all of them. Uh, in the the Pro VC's office, Julia Taylor um, makes all of these things happen with 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 uh, 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 the most amazing amount of grace and the most amazing amount of energy. Thank you so much, Julia. I want to thank you all those those of you who are here and those who are online for um, making the time uh, the time to be here today. Um, and for engaging with us on come on these questions of climate change. And last but not least, I think you would all agree with me that that was the most amazing afternoon. Um, I don't think I've come across someone who's who's uh, uh, got uh, got the ability to 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 paint a a a. a, a, a a canvas that is so wide, and to paint it with such clarity and 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 such and such enormous insights. So thank you so much for that, Adam. And I, I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking Adam. <laughs> so, uh, and Professor Tuz will will speak at two other events at bits. There's a. a there's an event at Standard, uh, kind of Standard Bank tomorrow on on uh, kind of African futures, and we have a seminar um, at twelve o'clock on Thursday um, on our Park Town uh, uh, campus, where uh, kind of Professor Tuz will be in conversation with the uh, 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 governor of the Reserve Bank of South Africa. If you've not already signed up for those, please please. Uh, uh, Kind of feel free to check the university's website. Uh, the details of those are all there. Um, I'm 